out there in the land of, does anybody care? It looks like I'm actually watching on screen as I'm whistling. So this must be about out of phase oh, a minute. Some of you are not getting notices. I just got a notice telling myself that I'm going online. Hey, a few seconds ago, it says. So by now, you're going to get the message that Darby is online. And Darby tried to tell you he's going to come online. And he put homework up for you. And a list of tools to think about, dream about, dream about. And then you'll have them up here. Well, it may take it a little bit. But first, you got to know what they are. So the first thing we're going to do is try to go ahead and cover a list of tools this evening once everybody joins in. And when I say everybody, that means, yes, pictures showing up on top means people are going to show up. What an amazing thing. Saturday night, date night number two for the weekend. Aren't you glad I didn't go out with Trinity out on the town dancing and partying and getting drunk like everybody else does? Why? This is more fun. Besides, it's darn hard to climb out of this little box here and get into a bar when you're just a cyber head, talking head. You know, <laughs> No legs, you just can't walk around. Anyway, did everybody get over to the site and look at the list? This is what we're talking about. All the tools that you would need to build a tiny house. If you're going to create a tr uh, an outpost, a pure salvage outpost, under the uh, species that you might actually want to go ahead and get some of the millions of dollars of materials that I'm going to be giving away to people who want to do outposts where they can have a, a base to build houses out of. An outpost, is pure salvage outpost is effectively, uh, nowadays they have things called like the makers um, um, co-ops. So you have tools for everybody to use, um, advisors, elders, um, other professionals that might be doing it for a living, hanging out in a community, unity, communicating, teaching, you know, that kind of thing I keep talking about over and over again. They, gets very low action, traction. Um, but I honestly believe there's a few people out there that this actually would and should um, entice into thinking of a plan whereby you can move out of the city and move out into the country with somebody. Somebody to help put all these things together because you can't do it by yourself. Everybody keeps saying, I'm going to go do it by myself. I'm going to work all my life so I can get enough money and retire and go out and get myself a little place. Only problem is, you may not have that much time left. Has anybody noticed there's a problem? It got worse. Yes, it got really, really a lot worse. Because then all tropical plants, meaning things that are not supposed to be exposed to under, say, 32 degrees for very long, like hardly at all, ever. Well, all the way down in Mexico, all over Texas, anywhere you want to go. Well, they're not looking so good. Salvage Texas has all sorts of dead Egyptian papyrus laying around and dead cattails and dead this and dead that. But luckily I got some live animals. Most of them did good. But plants, that's the... Fauna and flora, the flora part of that. Pretty flowers, fruit, food. They're estimating at least half of the winter wheat crop may be damaged in Texas. We produce a lot of wheat in Texas. If half of our crop is damaged, guess what? America. Just like our natural gas. Guess what? You don't get none. And you know what? Considering we're not shipping you our natural gas and the pipeline's cut off, which I really don't care for, don't like, but on the other hand, the electric... Oop, I almost got cut off again. I remember last time we talked about that this morning. I tried to, but there seems to be a problem when I talk about things like that. So, just in case anybody hadn't noticed and they hadn't got their newest, um, newest bill, 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 yes. The reason we're talking about tools is you might want to get out and build yourself a tiny house that doesn't use much electricity. Because, yeah, we've had a little problem, and it's not going to go away real soon, and it's this problem. Remember that one? There's your house. Now, if you got a big house, you got a big problem. $17,000 electric bill. You know how many tools you can buy with $17,000? That completely fits out 
a pure salvage outpost in the deluxe of deluxe tools. That means corded power tools and all the battery operated tools you could possibly want for $17,000. And that's equal to one month's new electric bill that used to cost only $650, no, $1,000. Okay. So that's only an increase of $17,000 over instead of 1000 but now, if you didn't have that big house already and you weren't putting all the electricity and trying to keep the darn thing hot in a cold day, or how about keep it cool on a cold day? I mean, they were keeping it like 60 degrees. It cost them $3,500. 60 degrees. Isn't that good? Now, if your central air and heat's going and you think you're just going to turn it on and forget about those other rooms that are being heated, don't worry. You won't forget. You'll be reminded at the end of the month. To that end, <sighs> adversity is the mother of invention. That means that when shit gets rough, the rough get going. And right now, y'all need to be thinking real hard. If an apartment that normally costs a hundred dollars a month electric hits a thousand, and a house that costs six fifty hits thirty five hundred. And your bill normally is 2000 at the business or 3000 like mine used to be. That means it's 10000 And I guarantee you what I'd be doing in my business is locking the doors. Mm. Not going to stick around and try to keep the business going. Now, just imagine you're like a great big uh, Walmart that just has power go down. Like many Walmarts and many HEBs, they thawed out and had to throw away millions and millions of dollars in food that don't get into people's bellies. They get into the dump. Great time, huh? Meanwhile, all the junk food rows at the local HEB grocery stores are absolutely empty. But all the rows with the good stuff on it, the vegetables, you know, things like that, yeah, there's still stuff there. So if you're going to go with stuff, now's the time to get those things. Eggs, 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 chickens. Start with chickens. Got more eggs. Don't eat the chicken. Eat the roosters. So save one. Good one. Nice, quiet, calm one. You can get calm chickens and calm roosters out of calm roosters being bred. So the point of this is, though, guess what? That's not one of the tools for making a house. That's simply one of the tools you need after you make the house to stay alive and eat once you get in the house. Now, you don't want to have to use electric power if you can help us. You want to design your house, as I have learned to do in my research and development over the years, so that you can go ahead and just... Keep it cool in the summertime by opening your windows. Novel concept, huh? And in the wintertime, close your windows with good insulation. And put your storm windows on instead of your screens. You're going to be good. You know what? A few clothes on, and you won't even need any air in electric. Guess what? That ain't so bad. Now you pick one room, and you heat that room up. Maybe that common house, that 200 square foot, 300 square foot, 400 square foot. No, 395 square foot in Texas. That house you'd heat. Everybody comes there, talks. Their body heat helps keep everybody else hot. And you sit there, chat, keep your blankies on. And when you leave, you keep your clothes on. You go home, you sleep underneath really nice blankets with long johns on. And that's the way you live for a little bit. And then summer comes. Ah, thank you. We'll be hitting 60, 70 degrees this week. So for us, it doesn't have to be summer. That's your summer up north. For us, I get out of my long johns and I get into some other clothes, but not much. Um, now, to that end, if you want to get into a tiny house, this whole thing's about how I'm going to go ahead and give millions of dollars of Brad's good stuff away so that you can go ahead and build your community of tiny houses and have to have to do that, a place to build them in and tools to build them with. And that's what this little lecture tonight by Professor Loophole himself is going to talk to you about. Yes, Darby. Darby Lennick, at your service. Master Professor of Loopholes. Tiny house construction uses portable buildings, which basically defies all building code. Because you're not allowed to do what we do, according to code. Yeah, your stairwell is supposed to be three foot wide and change, seven foot risers. That means it goes up seven inches every time, seven inches riser, I'm sorry, and a 12 inch tread. So I got a big ass foot, I can put on that tread and I go up like this. And that means I'm going to use up three foot across by one foot across and every time I go up I go up seven inches and so if my second floor is eight foot plus my my joist say nine foot divided by seven nine nine times twelve think about this kids all you big smart kids 108 right divided by twelve 
Okay, yeah. seven inches a step. That's why I divided by seven. But what it tells you is that you used up half your darn house in a tiny house to make a three foot wide stairwell to go upstairs, which is stupid. So during the development years, we actually provided you with many plans whereby your stairwell could be compressed into 12 square feet and have lots of storage. And if you want to have a bar underneath it with a lock so the kids can't get in your booze like we did for one place down by the river. All sorts of ways you can be clever. And being clever is what this is all about. How do I set up Pure Salvage Outposts for all you clever little beavers to make good stuff out of salvage lumber so that it'll last and it last and last? And why is that important? You may not want to import a bunch of stuff in the future. You may not want to go to Walmart every week to buy more crap to have a breakdown the week after that. You might just want to go ahead and have some American-made, pride and quality, old-fashioned, last-a-lifetime stuff. Oh, wait a minute. How old do you have to be before you remember that now? Quiz question. Suzanne, welcome back. Sherry, yeah, you answered that question. How long? Nikki, how long has it been since we had quality and American craftsmanship that we could be so proud of that we didn't want to go and buy something from Sealand? I can't use that word. I got shut off on that word. Can't say bad things about Sealand. That's S-E-A, right? Sealand. Mm -hmm. And there's other things we're not supposed to talk much about, it seems. I ran into a few of those this morning. Food. I had some really, really good, some of these. And I, I started talking about them, and next thing you know, I couldn't talk anymore. Because I was going to talk about how expensive these could get if you had to go to a refrigerator. And the refrigerator cost you 32,000% more for electricity than it did last week. Which... which in my fantasy book of Wibbley and Wub, in the chapter that just got time capsule sent back to me. That's what happened. Mmm. There was a message in the time capsule that Darby sent back. Darby, old Darby. I know, I kind of refer to it like somebody else. It's actually me, but it doesn't seem like me 30 years, 25 years from now. Mm. Yeah. I'm too old to make it that long. But as the story goes, yeah, 25 years from now when the book gets published, finally, and you guys are all part of it. Sherry's built her little place. And all these other people built their little place. Yeah, in the 80s. That's when the American, I think it's even longer back than that, 80s, 70s. I think in the 70s, we were still American pride and go, go, go. We can build it better. We can build it nicer. We can build it stronger. And then we went to, no, we don't want to work. We'll send our jobs overseas and let us train our replacements. And you can fire us and let us go and shut our corporations down and let our towns go to hell. That was, I thought that was started in the 70s. Hmm, maybe it was 80s. But it seems like it sure picked up you know, momentum. And we kind of lost the phrase. Pride in American craftsmanship. Pride in America. Wait a second. You suppose that if, if Hollywood were to be bought up by the Chinese who were buying all of our really good stuff, super cheap, and didn't want us to wake up and stop selling them cast iron, brass, steel, things like that that we can't possibly replace for what we're selling it for, do you think they might want us not to use those kind of words and talk about them buying all of our food and stuff like that and not leaving us any? Because who needs grapes, right? I mean... Hmm. I do. But, now refrigerating grapes. If you're an HEB, a big grocery store, and you have a $20,000 a month electric bill, and it went up 32,000%, grapes about a buck a piece. The longer you leave it sitting in the refrigerator, the more expensive it gets. Hi, Trisha. Hey, Shauna. No, I know you don't remember the 80s. We're even born in, girl. I know, I know, man. And trust me, people will tell you this. It was better in the 80s. Yeah, I didn't come to Texas till 1984, and that's when I realized George Orwell was wrong. 1984 got here, and it didn't happen. Big Brother wasn't here. Orwellian language change hadn't happened, and mind monitoring using computers and cameras hidden and hmm, that's not possible it could never happen no and then you were born 
Shauna, and somewhere in the next few years after that, um, hmm, they get started. Oh, wait, Walmart started by Pushy Family. Wait a second. Do you know what Mr. Walmart himself did before he started Walmart in the fictional story, of course? Yeah, he was a military guy. Yeah, he got out of the military and started up the Walmart chain using an old Ben Franklin store to start with. And then he grew it and grew it and grew it really fast. But before that, guess what he did? He was in charge of underground prison systems. And then, after he started Walmart, he went back in kind of on the sly. You know, like you don't really tell everybody you're back in working for the secret side of the government because it's a secret. Why would you go tell everybody that? You might say he grew pretty big, pretty fast with China's help uh, along the way when the rest of the family got into playing in the band. Guess what? Not a good place to hang out if you don't really want to support America. You can go there all the time. But if you find American made stuff in there, please buy it. Yeah, it's special. There used to be a day when I remember you lock in Walmart. It said made in America all over the place. Do you remember that, anybody? Yeah. Just a department store full of American made products. Sam Walton was really nice about setting that hook really deep. There's a lot of those mysteries in our past Walt Disney, Disneyland. Little mysteries here and there, and if you dig in a rabbit hole, you'll know where all the rabbit shit's hidden. So, meantime, we're talking about tools. Thank you. Okay, along that end, to that end, I wanted to go ahead and discuss the tools you need to open up your place. Your place saying that you guys, the ones that are listening and faithful to wanting to go ahead and do something for the world and create these little tiny communities outside the city... I have a list I posted just a little while ago of all the wonderful tools you need. And why do I have that list? And that's so I can make sure I tell all of you nearly all the tools, which isn't that many. But you know what? If I don't tell you, somebody's going to say, you didn't warn me I'd have to buy all those tools and all I got is my jackknife. How am I going to build a house with a jackknife? <clears throat> Guess what? You're probably not going to build a house with a jackknife. But if you want to get some tools... Ah, here they are. Rubbles is here to help. This is, he's taking us down the tool portal. Okay, the tool portal is where you go to get tools. Now, there's several ways of getting tools. What's the tool portal? Well, there's going to Walmart and buying what looks like a good tool or going to a big store, a big box store. And it says on the side of it, it tells you the model number. And then it has various versions of the model number, which most people don't know. There is the super duper cheap, I'll break in a minute, no, 20 man hours version. And that may be a type A or type F or whatever their code is for saying, this has got the least amount of stuff we could put into it and still have the darn thing operate. Yeah, it did used to be, didn't it? I knew it had. Thank you, Randy. It was a made in America one time. So now what happens? Now they also make, say it's DeWalt. Say it's um, any one of them. They're actually made by almost all. Two or three companies now make all the power tools. See, if you can keep printing money and just go out and pay any price in the world for companies, then you can dissolve them, just basically flush them out of all their employees and retirement funds, and you go ahead and take over the brand and make it all over to another company that might be, say, in another country. Yeah. Craftsman was American made at one time, too, but you have to have a store to sell it in. And Sears, guess what? The managers of Sears dissolved it in another company they started. That's what you do when you buy companies and dissolve them. Now, Rubbles, as he comes in, he's going to take you through this pool. Right here. Tool portals are places you go to pull tools out. And I suggest some places that are cheap. To start with, estate sales. But better yet, if you're in a small town, if you've got a group, if you're going to try to come to me and get me to give you millions of dollars worth of materials and a little bit here, a little bit there, two, three houses, five houses to you and open out an outpost to build them in. That's what the idea is. And grow it. 
In six months, I'll be putting out another million dollars of materials. And if some of the people got in there, got their five houses built, got their outposts going, they're already making some money, building some other things, coming out here and get some windows and doors, building from other people too, making income for their new village. So the ideology has a an income. Imagine that. It might be barter. People might bring you tools, toys, tractors, things like that. You give them cat houses, dog houses, chicken coops, kids' houses, playhouses, grandma's house. She's moving back home. We just need a little place. And you know what? I make some of the best little places there are. Yeah. Seven by nine. That's one of them back there. 67 square foot inside. Another one's 80 square foot. Ginger Swan. And believe me, plenty of people stayed in them. Black & Decker owns Craftsman. I think they also own several others, Shauna. Um, that's the sad part. When I found that out, it about made me sick. I'm Craftsman and Black & Decker. That was, like to me, like the bottom and top rung once upon a time when I was a kid. Black & Decker was Kmart, and Craftsman was Sears. Now, remember, Kmart went bankrupt. Three years later, came out of bankruptcy, bought Sears. And it didn't take them that terribly long to run it bankrupt, too. How does that happen? You think it's just coincidence, or maybe somebody's mastered the art of Hmm. Taking and buying big companies and dismantling them because the assets are greater than the potential income off of them for a short-term investor who wants an exit strategy that is less than five years. Which I hear whenever I go and ask for some help from investors is they want to know how are we going to exit in five years, dissolve it, cash out, abandon ship, and run like a rabbit. Except that it's my company that I kind of spent a whole bunch of years helping Brad build. And now we're going to give it away in a very fashionable way instead of give it to the rich and have them cash it in. Who wants to sell a business and all that inventory to rich people who don't need your money and won't sell it to the people that need it most? Instead, rather than have that all turn into income and tax, you just give it all away. Now, I'm just a fictional character inside of here, so I don't need to have write-offs, but... Yes, thrift stores. Absolutely. She's okay. Here's a good one. Bob Tango. Most underrated places I've found carries quality American made tools is thrift stores and estate sale shops. And I got an old screwdriver, for example, he says, and uh, stuff like that. So I'm, I'm actually totally in agreement. Um, I've been shopping estate sales, and I highly recommend too that look at if somebody's got an estate coming up and you go down to the local, um, let's just say the beauty parlor, and you talk to the little old ladies that run the beauty parlor. And you say, hey, we're looking for somebody that might want to donate some tools and stuff because they might have been a craftsman over the years. It might be stuff sitting out in the barn. That's a great place to get blacksmithing tools, for example. And it might be stuff. And if you go ahead and let them know we're out there to help them, we'll come over and clean up their garages, clean out their sheds for free. We'll clean out the barns for free. In fact, we'll take the barn down for free. They will give you millions and millions of dollars and stuff. That's why more millionaires are made out of salvage than any other business. So as you're going over to get your tools, you happen to pick up the old 55 Chevy that's sitting out there that daddy left me. And he was always going to remodel and fix that up, but it never happened. I need to get my car in there. Could you just haul that away for me, please? Pretty please. You'd be amazed. Absolutely amazed that if you get there before the estate sale happens and that little old lady finds out that you're trying to do this little pure salvage outpost so that you could build grandbabies, little tiny houses the old fashioned way, respecting the past, respecting her life and what she did, blood, sweat, and tears, trying to make a family back in the days when you couldn't get loans. You let these elders know that, and I guarantee you, you're going to have tools, you're going to have knowledge, you're going to have wisdom. Because these people believe in God and they're going to be there soon and they want to go ahead and do what they can do good, loving, to help you. Now, you smart-ass kids that got no respect and want to go and beat them up and disrespect them and take their money. No. When I catch you doing that, I'm going to whip your ass. Because your mom and daddy forgot. You don't disrespect your elders, you honor them. If at all possible. Now, if they're an adult druggy and, and drunk and and laying in the street, pissing on themselves. Yeah, it's pretty hard to honor somebody like that. You know, you got to also feel a little empathy, though, because you don't know how they got there. They gave up. Don't give up. Don't give up, please. That's why I'm here. I'm here to make sure you don't give up. All of you. Because it looks bleak sometimes. It looks really bleak. And I've been there. I've eaten out of dumpsters. I've been so cold when I woke up in the morning, I couldn't get out of my sleeping bag, cocoon bag, at six degrees, put my clothes on. I had to pull them in there with me. 
and then hit my head on the icicles coming out of the ceiling of my school bus because I didn't realize you get icicles inside of a place if it gets that cold. And actually had a spot on my head, punched my head with an icicle coming out of the ceiling out of a screw. I put wood on top of the, the steel struts for the bus, but it got so cold, the icicles developed on the screws that went through the wood. Really important. And Bob, by the way, um, it's really important, and I bet you ran into this too. When you get into talking to elders and you go into estate sales and stuff like that, you want to look for the ones that say American tools. Don't go buy one of those really super duper gorilla import bars. I mean, they gorilla yellow. They look great. And I've had all my weight on one of those crowbars and had that puppy pop loose. Break. Snap. It's still cheap. 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 Compared to the old quality of American. You put an American piece down there and you can pull on it all you want. You might break a bone. You might break a back from not being able to hold on. But it's not going to be because the crowbar broke. Serious stuff, man. When your life's dependent on you're running tools that you're going to try to tear apart something with. You don't want it to go breaking. No. So, try to use the old tools when you can. I found it very handy to go buy some seriously good quality old craftsman stuff when it was all stainless steel body. I mean, those old belt sanders, they look like a locomotive and about way like one, too. But you pull that trigger and it's got so much torque, it goes in their worm drive um, belt sanders. There are a couple of them out there. Craftsman made one of them. It was excellent. Back in those days, Porter Cable, Craftsman. Um, there's like three brand names in those days. And if you got that, you had a tank. Now you have to replace the brushes, do a little lubrication on them. But overall, you buy two or three of the same one if you can find it. And then you cannibalize and keep one alive for another 20 years. As the old saying goes. And then do the rest of it. Use it for art. Do some really cool steampunk and looking stuff with all the, the gears and stuff. But honestly... Old tools are good tools. Don't think a new tool is always going to be a better tool because it's really built for most of them, about 20 man hours of work. In my shop, when I had a professional shop going, you put that sucker to work in eight hours a day. Wow, that was good for a week. What? You already wrote, wrote my tool already? Because on top of that, you put a, somebody on it and he's got a, 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 a orbital sander and he thinks the harder I press, the better it's going to work. No, it doesn't work that way. So you, you have a certain amount of pressure. If you go past that, you'll sure tear the thing up, but you won't make it sand any better. And this happens to apply to a lot of tools. So you got to give some people some action, uh, like teaching action. On those big chop saws, you know, you drop that puppy down, and you just pull the trigger and drop it, and don't let it get up to RPM. You're going to burn the triggers out and the handles super fast. Well, it's not a lot. It's maybe 40, 50 bucks for that trigger if you get another one, but they have a real nasty habit of discontinuing the parts you need to keep them in service. So you buy another one instead. Imagine that. So when you do buy stuff, buy two or three of the same one if you're going to do an outpost. And that way, if one goes down, you take the parts and move it on to the next one. If you're going to buy a brand of tools, try to stick with the brand. I happen to like DeWalt. Um, I used to like Bosch. Uh, but again, they all own each other again. And so the trick is to find buy a... There's um, some places that sell what's called builder's grade tools now builders grade tools the same look on the outside same body style same model number but it's a different type heavier wiring heavier brushes um heavier bearings all sorts of things that are upgraded for that model and you know why is that one 280 dollars and this one's 195 because this one's for hairy homeowner who's going to use it eight times and drop it leave it outside lose it somebody's gonna walk away with it he doesn't care but the guy that cares like me who's by really good tools they still walk away it doesn't do any good. They still grow legs. Cheap tools grow legs as fast as expensive tools. Surprise, surprise. So, don't buy stolen tools. If somebody else's name, if somebody else's preferably driver's license or phone number is engraved into the tool, or there's evidence that somebody tried to take it off their market out, hide it, don't buy the tool. Don't support thieves and liars who probably stole tools just like my own employees did. Please, honor us. When you get an outpost, it's a co-op. Hopefully people won't steal your tools, but still I advise you, you will have a lockup tool room and a checkout system so people check it out and you put it back in there at the end of it. What tools? You say, what tools? He hasn't talked about those tools yet. Okay. Tools. So I don't want to go ahead and set everybody up for failure and give them a bunch of stuff and have them piled up under a tent and not be able to put it together and make houses. So 
These are lessons. And for those who don't know it, the lectures are about how are you going to go ahead and use the money if you were to get it. And if you're only going to bother to listen to the lectures, you're not going to listen to the videos, you're not going to understand how to do it, and you don't have any experience, and you don't have any tools, and you don't have any places to put them, and you don't have anybody to help you, then I'm going to spot that. I'm going to pay attention to it. And we're not going to waste a bunch of our time because you didn't take any time, invest anything into getting... $50,000, $100,000 worth of materials that in turn will make you a million dollars if you put it together right. Yes. My strategy is simple. The first million is the hardest to make. So rather than you go out and make the first million, I'm going to make the first millions available to you to make millions with. That means the knowledge the research and development. I'm not charging anything. No franchise fee. I'm not taking anything out of your pocket. You make it, you make it. It's yours. I want you to morph every pure salvage outpost into the wonderful, unique community center it can be to teach. And I'm not the one to teach everything because there are elders besides me that know so much more than I know. They will come and help you if we have the centers there. They will come and donate time, tools, Teach you how to use the tools because a tool is no good if you cut your hand off with it. A tool is no good if you poke your eye out with it. Please. The chemicals you work with, they are not good if you don't know what you're doing and you put them on certain skin areas, certain places. If kids get in certain things, this is not good. But if you know about it, it's safe. It's easy. It's okay. And soon, they're going to try to outlaw and ban most of this from being able to be taught to anybody under 16. Can you believe that? Yeah, if you're under 16, I can't hire any kid like when I was a young boy to work because you might hurt yourself. And so you can't do anything that might have a motor on it. Please. Used to be at 14, 15, you left home at 16. By 16, you're married, starting your farm, your ranch. And like Custer, you'd already be dead. By the time you're late 20s, your story was written, good or bad, you'd be gone. Now, look, I'm still here at this late age, and I'm feeling like a kid. Because every time I say I'm late age, they go, you're just a kid. And I'm going, what do you mean? I'm, I'm 89. I go, holy cow, thank you. Thank you for letting me know that people can still be lucid and functional. Because when I was a kid, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. So, now, Big Light is still American-made. No kidding. They're going to get real expensive price of fuel, huh? Imagine 32,000% increase in the price of butane, natural gas, and propane. Imagine if butane goes up, which is actually much more explosive and much more difficult to handle. But if butane goes up 32,000%, this lighter at $1 might run about 100 uh -oh, Oops. Talking about the loss of the value of the dollar. A hundred bucks to buy a lighter. Yeah, I know in Bosnia and in other places when there was war and the SH hit the fan. Well, guess what was one of the best, most valuable things was a clear. Not this kind here with the blue. You can't see how much is in it. I could rip you off. You don't know if it's full or not. Look, it's full. Ah, uh, I see. That was one fire that might have fed your family. That was one fire that might have kept you alive in a storm. That was one easy to get fire that you didn't have to go rub no do sticks together. You didn't have to do any of that fancy crafty shit. Except stack your wood real careful, have your tinder ready, and use one strike for as little time as possible. Because this could save your life in these storms we just had. If you don't have fire, you don't have heat. You don't melt water. You don't cook food. How much is that lighter worth to you? Your family's starving to death. How much is that lighter worth to you? Clear, you can see it in there, the beautiful liquid. And you know, you touch that thing and it's going to light your, light your fire. Your family's going to live. You don't have it. They don't live. Got any extra lighters stashed away, guys? Guess what? You should. That's what's called preparation. Because right now, by the time you're thinking, man, I wish I had something to burn. Oh, I wish I had a way to start the fire to burn it with. Is the 
first primary question. So, tools. Get some lighters. You might want to heat up your pure savage outposts and start it with a lighter. Once you got lighter, you got fire, you can make steam power. You can make all sorts of things happen with fire that you cannot make happen without it. So why not get a lighter and stick it away for the day you may need it? There's other things to use it for, by the way. Not that anybody would have a clue what I'd be talking about. Anyway, you ready? I actually wrote all these down. Trade school is being shut down every day. Oh, you did? You sent both your kids to learn a trade? Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Um, I'm proud proud of you. That is actually, um, in this day and age, rare. Um, apprenticeships nowadays used to be five years apprenticeship and you got to go off on your own. But five years means the person that trained you got the benefit of using your talents and your energy and the talent that he basically gave you, the knowledge, to build stuff with. And then you can go off on your own and have a career. Nowadays, the apprenticeships that I went through, I trained them for two, three years, and they wouldn't give me notice, and they'd be gone the next day. And I'd have trained them in every department I had, and uh, spent all sorts of money to get them trained, and then they'd be gone. Bye! No, they didn't say bye, as a matter of fact. Save of the moment. Save of the day. Mmm. Yeah. And savor your grapes. Okay. I know everybody can't get to the other computers, can't see what's on Facebook, but there's a list. The list is all the things that I normally would say you need to have for a shop, a small shop, not a big shop. If you have these, it's enough to be able to go ahead and well, probably build 10 houses, 15 houses before you have to replace them all. Um... I'll give you the most essential ones first because you can do a lot with little if you're smart. A circular saw, for example. If you have a good, good heavy-duty hand circular saw, I like two kinds. There's a worm drive and there's also just a regular circular saw. One's lefty, one's righty, actually, believe it or not. They do make left and right saws. For those of you people who have an issue with left and right, you can actually buy left-hand saws and stuff. Steam power, free screen. Yeah, come on. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody get on your bicycles and get that little generator going so you can run your uh, charger and keep your phones going. Did you know you can do that now? There's a really cool bike you can get and you actually take your feed out of it and you use it to feed to charge your phone. So as long as you're pedaling, you get to watch. Isn't that cool? All right. All right. Ready? All right. Compound slider saw. Very handy. Very dangerous. It is basically a saw that allows you, like a chop saw, but if it grabs the board in your thumbs in front of it and it runs across the board towards you and you're not ready for it, it will cut your thumb off. That is, what I bring it first and foremost is, it is the most dangerous tool that will cut off more fingers and more hands than any other tool that you will put into any pure salvage outpost. It's going to be that radial arm sort of slider compound saw. So you can cut sideways and everything else. But it comes out about 16 inches. You can lock it down so it won't, but you want to cut the board. You want to cut a wide board, you let it go and you bring it out. But if you go too fast, don't hold it right or anything else, it can actually jump and come at you. And if your thumb is in front of where the saw blade is, and they have a little laser now that actually shows where to cut your thumb off at if you happen to do that. I don't recommend it. I recommend green light therapy to fix you when you cut yourself, but don't go and test it by cutting your thumb off and see if you can seal it back up again with one of my green laser tricks. <laughs> Boom. Okay, next. Um, you can get a regular chop saw that doesn't slide. It's a lot safer, and it's good to have one of those as well. And that one just moves left and right, allows you to do compounds, which is turning the angles on it, and chop. Okay, that's better than a regular circular saw unless you're really good. It's hard to get really accurate corner cuts, 30 degrees, 33 degrees, whatever you need to make a, a, your corners meet. That's not easy with just a hand circular saw, so you want to have that. These are the big tools to start with. I'm going through fast, so please, if you don't follow it, don't worry. I got a whole list of it all done with a nice cartoon header to keep everybody entertained while they're reading the real stuff down below. For This is actually meant to be for kids because for the most part, adults, they ain't got no time. So when I'm done, I'm going to have a kid's book on how kids can get together and build this after y'all are gone. Don't do it. Sit on your asses. Anyway, okay. I'm sorry, did I get distracted? That wasn't me talking. 
Right, next thing, table saw. Absolutely have to have a table saw. That's for plywood, it's for boards, stuff like that. You've got to split something long. It's, it's harder to do it by hand and get a straight line, but a table saw will do it. The trick is make sure you get a at least a medium grade table saw. Don't get the Harry Homeowner, cheapest you make, Ryobi. Um, go ahead and step up, and I used to say go up to a craftsman, and you can buy the old ones. Now, again, buy old tools in good condition that were owned by old people who took care of them and cleaned them up afterwards each time and respected the tools because they know that a tool lasting a lifetime meant you could work and create your entire life with that tool. And once upon a time, they designed tools to last for a lifetime. They even have that's called a lifetime guarantee, a foreign thing nowadays. Craftsmen used to be you took your tool back in the Sears store and said, look, you're broke. And they said, oh. Here, here's a new one. Thank you very much. No charge. Not a good business plan because obviously they're not around anymore, but I love their tools. Proto and other things for mechanical tools, wrenches, stuff like that. Buy a good tool because the last thing you want is for that tool to break when you got all your strength on it and it snaps. Your knuckles go, your, you get hurt. So, again, ready, ready. Next one. Yeah. Um, the uh, bandsaw, if you can get one, a standing bandsaw. Old ones work just as good as new ones for the most part. Check to make sure that the, um, they've got guides for the blades on them. And there's rubber on the wheel, which can be replaced using an old tire and contact cement. You can take an inner tube and replace the rubber on those big old wheels and get the blade to run again. And they last forever, ever and ever. i got some of them that are cast iron cases on them still. I must have three or four of them because I just like them. They're pretty. Maybe we'll give one of those away. And remember, everybody signs these waivers of liability so that if you work in one of these places, if you're helping out in one of these places and you hurt yourself, you're not going to sue somebody. It's an agreement in advance. And nobody in the pure salvage outpost movement believes in going to court and suing people to get rich or blaming people for what you did wrong and making it their fault and taking everything they own away in a legal court system that's lawyers pillage both sides without ever reaching a verdict that helps anybody except them. I, I firmly believe that part of the doctrine of the pure salvage living outpost and the pure salvage living renaissance is that a handshake means something. And we don't forget you. If you start screwing around with everybody, you open an outpost and you're just a nasty ass, lying, thieving son of a gun and we missed you and you got through the cracks. We aren't going to forget about you. No, we're going to make sure everybody else knows that's what you are. I've got nothing to hide. I don't own all these stores. They're your stores. We're starting them up as your county, your village, your town that wants to have a, a, a resource center. It might be a town that gets together and say, yeah, we're ready to do this. We're a small town, and we have a building there, and we, have, we want to save the old people. We want to save the town and keep the young people here. And so we want to open one of these outposts and convert these big old houses and all these old buildings and stuff and convert them into tiny houses and teach people how to do it. Maybe we open a little school here. And then the old people can move into the tiny houses that are made out of the best things out of their big old houses. And the rest of it can go to the community to go ahead and build other houses for other people. And as you downgrade the size of the house, then you also reduce the amount of utilities and electric needed. So the whole town can live on less utilities and less electric instead of more bonds to build more crap, to pump more septic and sewer into the rivers. And to destroy more land by having nice big gated communities with big asshole houses that nobody can pay the electric on. And if you don't, then you... Anyway. Okay, next. Any questions? That is. Sippo lighters. Um, you know what? Sippo lighters. Great. Do you put the darn thing overfilled in your pocket as a guy? If you haven't done that, I highly recommend that when you fill your new your Zippo lighter up with all that brand new fluid and it hadn't quite drained out the top of it, it's still in the bottom, and you put it back together and you slap that sucker together and you flip it and it works and you slip it in your pocket, if it's not pointed right up, way up, it's going to be a hot time in the old barn tonight. Do, do, do. You're going to open that barn door in a hurry because it will fry your little package. In lighter fluid, or you like the way you put it, naphtha. That's so much more romantic. Sippo lighter fluid, yeah. Lights in frigid weather, yeah. After you get it in your crotch and you crack that lighter open, you're gonna have one. <laughs> I 
Okay, eat her back. Okay, let's get back to this. You're distracting me. Sorry. But yes, he's right. Zippos were good stuff, though. Best of the best. And did you know Zippos, if you look at the bottom of it, the way the Z is done, the Zippos, the way the word is written on the bottom of it, they have slash marks. If you get a Zippo with five slash marks, that's a very valuable Zippo. If you get a Zippo on the bottom with three slash marks, not so much. So there's a, a rating system. So people collect Zippos, and I happen to be one of those people that really likes Zippos. Um, a Zippo lighter can be very expensive. Yeah, old ones. So keep that in mind. Um, yeah, a lot of people carry Zippos. Man, it was, it, was, it, was a, it was style. But now, let me tell you this. If you're constantly hitting on using a Zippo to start, you are inhaling fumes. And not always, always spent fumes. If you can smell it, it ain't spent. And having been um, occasionally around Zippos and having sucked on a few things near Zippos, objects that might have a way of allowing that scent to make it to your nose, that far away maybe, I don't like the Zippo smell, taste, feel kind of thing. And since I can smell taste, I think I might be inhaling it. And since I'm kind of into health, inhaling Zippo lighters is not good. So, yes. Now, inhaling butane, it also is not good. But, you know, there's different grades of butane. You can get extra butane with more crap in it and less crap in it. Who knew? So, if you're going to get refillable, big things of butane. Now, that's something I recommend. Because then you can refill those lighters until they run out of flint. And you'll notice that most of the portable lighters don't provide you with a whole bunch of flint. Zippo, you can change out the flint. And all those that sell those that say you can just go ahead and refill them indefinitely and they're lifetime guaranteed, it's the lifetime of the oldest man at the factory providing they're still alive when the lighter breaks. If otherwise that old guy dies, that's his lifetime. That, that, that warranty's over with. Forget it. I bought a few of those $30 lighters. They're really nice $30 lighters. They work really good for a while. And then those two little electrodes start to wear out. And some things happen. The electric doesn't work. Stuff like that. Okay. Whew. Next. The bandsaw to standing. That's what I said. You know, instead of that, you can also, and it's much easier to get when you're starting out, we'll go down to some small tools. And that's going to be just a jigsaw. A jigsaw will do almost everything your bandsaw would do for most people most of the time on building tiny houses. The bandsaw is really for doing fancier stuff, particularly if you want to do corbels and stuff like that. You want to get a bandsaw that will have at least a four-inch throat, allowing you to cut things that are four inches thick. Because none of the hand jigsaws will cut anything beyond about two inches to two and a half inches without having distortions because the blade, it's hard to turn it. But a bandsaw will give you a perfectly straight cut if it's a table standing bandsaw. Lesson done. Same with the drill press. Normally a hand drill does great, but if you want to do bigger projects repeatedly and use a jig, a drill press is nice. Otherwise, just get a hand drill, a good quality hand drill, a corded version, and a battery version, and preferably a half inch chuck. So you can handle big bits and small bits, and you'll have a big enough motor that it won't burn out real easy, because if you take a little motor and overwork it, you will burn them up, and it's terrible. And the batteries on battery operated, um, always use a cord if you can, because when you are using batteries, you're using, A, the lifetime of the battery, but also the faster you charge it and discharge it, sometimes you can wear batteries out a lot faster than they say you can. So don't wear out your batteries before you need them. You take those out to the field and use them in the field. If you're in the shop, use, if at all possible, corded tools. And I'm spoiled. I don't do that. I'm always working out in the field. Think about that. I agree. Too much fluid in that lighter. That's absolutely right. But then again, that's what you learn. I'm just telling people that didn't learn, like me, you know. And incidentally, if you want to pull a really nasty trick on somebody and they got crotch rash, you know, heat rash, something like that, you go ahead and give them some, uh, something to put on that. It won't be Napa, but, um, you know, mentholatum heat rub, something like that. Yeah, they'll enjoy it. Okay, next. Drill. I mentioned drill. Router. Now, router is a very cool tool. It allows you to put edges on stuff. It allows you to work with Formica, which I don't like and don't use. It allows you to do a lot of cutouts and stuff like that if you get the right tips. But I highly recommend you want to get at least a half inch chuck, which means the stem on the bit is a half inch, not the smaller size. Because the smaller size actually will flex and the tools aren't as strong. And the motor's not as good, ergo, it's not going to last as long, especially if you're prone to abusing it. Okay. Um, next in line, circular saws. I highly recommend um, a good grade of circular saw, handheld circular saw. Lefties and righties, they make both, and have at least two on site, if not three. 
That's just somebody can drop one, bend the plate, they can get broken, all things can happen. You have to have a circular saw to build a tiny house. It'll make up for a lot of other tools, but a circular saw is essential. Now, when you do that, don't tie the guards back. That's the little guard that goes under the blade that you pull back. It's always getting in the way, and you just think, God, I wish that thing wasn't there. Okay, you can tie that back so that the blade's always exposed, but when you're done pulling the trigger and you let go, the blade's still spinning. Now, what's that mean? I've got a five-inch scar in my thigh. What it means is if you lay that saw down too close to your leg while the blade is still spinning, even though your finger is off the trigger, it will cut you. Called land sharks. So don't pull the guard back thinking you're a clever beaver like I did. Because after 12 hours of working with it, you get a little tired and you just have to lay it down a little too quick get near your leg and it'll just cut you wide open. I think that one took uh, 15 stitches or something like that. But it was my first experiment on it don't hurt, it won't bleed, believe it, and it doesn't happen. That works, by the way. Until I got to the hospital and they were going to put that needle in there to kill the pain. And I saw them putting a needle into my, my, my wound and all of a sudden my spell got broke. That's going to hurt. <clears throat> Instantly started bleeding. They'd already scrubbed it down with betadine and everything. I was still good. No pain. Until she said she's going to stick a needle in it to kill the pain. Which I didn't have until she said. I'm going to kill the pain. Anyway, the mind is an amazing tool. Use it, please. Later on I learned to do surgery. I've actually cut into my finger with a scalpel all the way down to the bone to go ahead and remove um, the front of a palm tree thorn. It got in there and laid parallel with the bone and built a cyst up. And tried once, failed, gave up, chickened out. A year later, the cyst got so big I did it again, put the finger on the table and said, okay, we're going for it. Except they didn't have the scalpel. Had an X-Acto knife. I'm here to tell you, X-Acto knives are not as sharp as scalpels. Comparably speaking, I would use um, the terms... A scalpel is sharp like a razor blade, and a X-Acto knife is sharp like a saw. Is that, that close to telling you how it felt? Okay. So, preferably don't cut yourself with dull objects. Cut yourself with very sharp objects. Have a green laser on hand to go ahead and heal yourself when you do that. Once upon a time, I was young. And I made a lot of stupid mistakes. So most of the things you hear me talk about, I talk about because I bled to learn the lessons. Next, sawzalls. That's a reciprocating saw. That's a blade that goes back and forth like this and is one of the most useful tools in the world. And plumbers are known to cut across and just absolutely hack apart some of the greatest carpentry in the world with those sawzalls. Because plumbers, see, they don't understand that wood's supposed to hold the building up that they keep cutting into to put the holes in so they can go ahead and put the pipes in. And so when they get done cutting your joist in half so they can put a pipe through there instead of drilling a hole in the middle of it, your floor bounces more. Imagine that. Strange how that works. So, which one do? No sound. That is. Oh, does anybody hear me? Hello. No sound. He lost my sound. Okay. Well, I'm not going to keep talking if nobody can hear me. Hmm. Guys, party may be over. 9.52. Yeah, I'm probably at the outer edge. I started this right about nine. So, I got, um, I'm supposing that some of you can hear me because you're still copying. Yeah, okay, good. I'm going to finish up this list, okay? And then I'm going to get off here. I got um, about seven more minutes that I have assigned to this. One hour. So, I've lost all the trolls. They've gone to bed. They're going, what the hell? This guy's using up all my time. I can't get no troll credits. I got to go hang on some people's sites and rah, mess with them. Okay, back, back to work, back to work. Okay. Circular saw, sawzall, jigsaw, one jigsaw, one sawzall. It's usually pretty good. That's all you need. Two nail guns each, each. What's that mean? What are different nail guns? Nail guns are, they operate with a compressor. You need a good compressor, two of them at least. Preferably they produce at least two and a half gallons per minute of air, cubic feet per minute. That's the way they measure it. I want to have five or six if you can do it in a pretty good size container so you can run four or five guns off of it. Okay. Now, shut down and reopen. Me? We hear you, we hear you. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. I so appreciate it. I'm going to try to finish. Sometimes, you notice they make my sink not work, so you see my lips move, and it looks like I'm an idiot because I can't move my lips at the same rate that I make sounds. Somehow that makes me look stupid. I'm not sure why, because I... Anyway, okay. 
Flooring gun. That's a special gun, and if you get the right handle on it, you don't have to bend over too far. A flooring gun is specially made to what's called blind nailing. It shoots the nail in at an angle, and there's several types of flooring guns, and you can use staples or a cleated L-shaped flat nail. I highly recommend the L-shaped flat nail over the staple, because staples don't tend to hold very well. But the cleated staple, it's a nightmare to get out of there. And I want you to use those. And they're not that expensive. They're about $19 for a box of 2,000 nails. And when you start paying that kind of price, you start paying attention to how many nails you use. And you don't need more than a certain amount. So think about that. That's the flooring gun. Then you need a framing gun. That shoots a 3.5-inch nail, a 3-inch nail, preferably. I personally like to use the wire nail clips because they have a, a clip nail. But it allows you to put um, 100 nails in a clip instead of 50 nails in a clip. No, excuse me, 50 nails a clip instead of 25 nails in a clip. And so I get tired of filling my clips up all the time. And so the old-fashioned DeWalt's, for example, or the um, there's a couple of them that will shoot them. But remember, the angles on the nails make a difference. So you want to buy guns that shoot a common nail, I mean a common angle, which I think is a there's 27 degrees, there's 24 degrees, on which the clip is made. And if you get the wrong one, it won't work in a different gun. So some of the guns have proprietary angles or nails. So you've got to buy your nails from them and only them. And if they disappear, rough ruck, Farley, you're out without a doubt. So buy a gun like a DeWalt or something that will shoot those generic nails. Now, preferably the generic or the DeWalt clip nails or generic clip nails at the right angle because you get more nails in smaller boxes and no ugly, nasty plastic every time you shoot a nail it leaves a chunk of plastic everywhere it's a nasty hazardous waste a tiny chunk that chickens and everything else will eat and not know what it is so they've got it in their mouth so don't use stupid stuff that big corporations make because somebody says okay now on the coast you have to use a round head nail now the reason for the difference in these two the round head nail has to be spaced further apart so that the rounded edge of the nail will get past the nail in front of it on the clip this is because a round-headed nail will hold 200 pounds more grip before it slips through the board than a clip nail. They clip the edge of it. It doesn't have as much surface area. It can't hold as well, so it pulls through the board easier. So they require near the shoreline where there's hurricanes and stuff that they have a full rounded nail. And that screwed up everything when it came down to the nail gun industry because now you can have a nail gun that shoots the round-head nail or you can have a nail gun that shoots the clipped head nails. And I'm telling you, if you're not near the coast, shoot the clipped head nails because... The difference between 800 pounds to pull a nail out and 1,000 pounds to pull a nail out, it's going to take a hurricane or a tornado to prove the difference. And with my wood, pff, you ain't pulling it out, period. So, oh, yes, duo fast. Made a great, great gun, but find nails. Not always so easy. Duo fast, also find parts. Duo fast will not sell you the parts. You got to go find a duo fast dealer to work on a duo fast gun. And if you don't oil it regularly, or if some fool goes and cranks up the air on your tank over 115 pounds, you're going to blow the seals out in the cylinder and you're going to want to buy more seals and fix it yourself for $7 in seals. And guess what? Nobody can get them. If you know how to do that, please, Sherry. I got about three or four duo fasts that need to be rebuilt. I love their guns. I love their siding gun. I love the way it feeds. Again, proprietary nails. You can't just go buy any nails if you got a duo fast. But yes, great, great, great. Now, nail guns. Next one, finish gun. Next one, stable gun. Next one, siding nailer. I kind of like siding nailers because they're special. They allow you to adjust the depth and the pressure on the nail. So that you don't go and put a hole in the siding that's an eighth inch or deeper that catches water and causes your siding to rot out faster. You want that nail to just hit right on the surface of the siding and just pull it up, snug it up tight and not go any further. Framing guns are notorious for leaving a bigger dent because it's the same amount of pressure. So if you're shooting into softwood or hardwood determines how much the nail is going to sink. This means that you leave big holes if it goes in easy and you can barely get it in all the way with my hardwood. I've had nails that won't go through a two by four. They'll hang up. And you go try to take a hammer out and bang it in the rest of the way, you better be accurate with that hammer because otherwise you're bending that nail over and just live with it because you're not pulling it back out. They have what's called a cement coated CC 16 penny framing nail. They also have a 
20 penny frame and nail, but a 16 penny is what typically is used. The CC cement coated means that little green coating on it, when it goes in, it has a cement that's activated by the friction and the heat when the nail goes in and penetrates, if it's got enough density in the wood, and that sticks after it sets for a second, and you can't get the nail hardly out of there. That's called a cement coated. And we used to have hand bangers and then we had gun nails. Nowadays, you put a hand banger in somebody's hand, they couldn't bang it in straight if you. Your life depends on you banging this hand nail in without bending it over. And you got, in the old days, the way we did the challenge, one to set it and absolutely no more than three to sink it. But the goal was to sink that 16-penny nail in a single swing. And you can do it on a log, but you got to hit that baby tough. And that's a really good game, a test, a fun game. You waste a lot of nails, but it's a fun game. Anyway. I use screws all the time. I love screws. I love Torx head screws. And the Ship of Salvage Dreams has not a nail in it. Sitting up there on top of the Miracle Mountain, that is all screws, Torx heads, and lumber screws. I highly, timber screws. I love them. Love them. Okay, next. You're going to want to have an impact driver. That's a hand tool that drives in those wonderful screws. And again, Torx heads, T-O-R-X. That's the head of a screw that's special. I like them there for decks and stuff like that. They're particularly good for old wood because you won't strip the head out in the process of trying to get the screw in. And if you strip it in, getting it in, and it doesn't get it all the way in, you can't get it back out. Then you break it off because the problem with screws is they're brittle. You can bend them back and forth. They'll break off. A nail, on the other hand, is actually not brittle. It is actually able to bend back and forth and not break off. So... If you're going down the highway, you want both. You want nails and screws. So that one, when it works its way out, like a nail will work its way out, a screw won't work its way out. But a screw will snap off if you put enough pressure on it, and a nail won't. So you can bend something with a nail, and it'll just bend the nail, but you'll still have at least a connection. The screw snaps off, you're gone, separated. End of story. I haven't had that happen very often. I'm a big believer in screws, but nails are good too. Now, I got to the, that gives you um, why you want a siding nailer as opposed to a regular nailer. Because when you put siding up, you don't want holes in it. It catches water and it's going to rot faster. And you got to fill it with putty and all sorts of other things. And same thing on the interior. I've used those on the ceilings, on beadboard and other stuff. If you've got a surface nail. Next thing you want to have is a, a nail shooter. And that's a gun. I don't know if we had that. Sherry, do we have my nail shooter back when we did that job? But you put it on the nail. Yeah, we did. You put it on the sharp end of the nail and the gun shoots the nail out backwards and it is fun almost to shoot it in fact um there are times when i by mistake of course uh would point the board out in the air and shoot it with that gun on the sharp side and shoot that nail out the back side of the board and you see it shoot 30 40 feet across the yard and land out there in some place we might forget to pick it up later on and they might not like that when you're cleaning out that house i think i remember that in a dream uh yeah kicker that's right nail kicker and Sherry, isn't that too? If you don't have a nail kicker, you don't need to be in the salvage business because you put a nail kicker in a lady's hand and you put two or three boys behind her and they'll have trouble keeping up with boards. She can pop them out of there. Those nails will pop out as fast as you can pull the trigger. Now, the ones that don't are the ones that you got to turn around and get the, the crowbar on because they're, um, the one end doesn't stick out far enough. But on the other ones, man, you go up there and just put that gun on there, bend the nail straight, pull the trigger, and go, boom! It's fun, isn't it, Sherry? Oh, man. I'm telling you what. And if you want to hurt somebody, not that you want to, but if you did, and you wanted to put a nail in there and just go, poo, guess what? And shoot that nail out there like a bullet. It hurts somebody. Really hurts somebody. Just in case you ever need a weapon on, on in a hurry. So, next thing you need. Um, that's all the nail guns, by the way. Um, you could have another, but I recommend if you're going to do this, again, try to buy the same product line for the most part. So you're carrying the same kind of nails and you don't get a bunch of confusion. I've got three different staple guns and I got three different size staples and damned if they're all just close enough that you can put them in there and get pissed off over and over again, trying to get them back out because they're tight enough to stick and not shoot. Tight enough to jam up the gun and occasionally shoot. Great enough to shoot two at a time and jam up the gun. There's all sorts of ways those nails will not work other than right, unless they're made for the gun. So what's easier than finding the guns all branded the same as the nails and just grab a pack and put it in? 
the easiest thing is to have the right ones match. The other way is, oh, gee, I grabbed them and they jammed it up. I spent 15 minutes rebuilding the gun so I can get the dang nails into it over and over again. So, please, pay attention to these things because they can save you a lot of trouble. Okay, um, palm sanders. I recommend at least one or two palm sanders and teach the little suckers. Get a little stick there and have them do it. And every time they push too hard on it, hit them in the back of the head with a stick. In no time, you'll teach people not to put too much pressure on a palm sander. Otherwise, you'll spend $50 a pop buying palm sanders once a week because some fool decided to go and take a nap with his hand on top of it and put his head on top of there too and fell asleep. Mm. Anyway. Okay. Then the other thing you have is you have half sheet sanders. That means you tear a sheet of sandpaper in half and you have half sheet sanders. That's really valuable on jobs. Planer, really good thing to have. Um, you want to have planer. You don't have to have a planer. Trust me, you do not have to have a planer. It's actually um, a good thing to have, but on old wood, it's just good for taking off some paint. I'm trying to find an ink pen. I just thought of something else. Um, and the reason to have a planer around is if you want to really shine up a board or something like that, it works great. But if you're going to get a planer and you're really going to get serious about it, get a decent planer. Get a multi, um, what's called a multi head. You have little tiny blades on it, and um, they're typically a uh, carbide. And it's called a helical head planer. If you can find one of those, instead of having only three blades, so when you hit a nail or something that somebody forgot to take out, then you won't chip all your blades. You can do that once or twice. You slide the blade this way, slide it this way. But after a while, you chip your blades up. You can't get a flat surface. With a helical head, you just turn the blade around. And it takes, like I had one, it's 250 little knives on it, staggered. So if you hit a nail, you can just take it out of there, turn the blade, and you had four different sides on it. That's a really good type to buy. But that, again, that's you don't need that typically to start. You can do a little hairy homeowner planer for basics, but overall, I don't like to use those planers. Belt sander, absolutely. Got to have a belt sander, one or two of them. I like the four-inch whisper sanders. Um, four inches is a better size. Three inches is nice. There's several types. One of them has the big back wheels and the small front, allows you to get into corners. The other one's just a big old train with a sandpaper on the bottom of it. That's a good one too. Um, helical heads, there's, that's a that's commercial for the most part. They're not going to be over in Home Depot or something like that. That's why I say you don't really need to get that, but that's a good one. If you are going to get into replaning or refinishing old boards, you really want to get a helical head with carbide bits. They're wonderful, but they're also a couple grand. And so, um, that's new, by the way. Use always buy hardware new. Buy stuff like that. Um, used if you find somebody honorable, honest, it's not worn much, not used much, because a lot of shops get going and can't make it, and they'll sell their equipment cheap. And so you want to be looking for that, or you might find elders that have some of the older planers. Sears um, had, I mean, there were actually a number of good old planers, heavy duty planers, about two foot wide. So they have about a 12 inch uh, blade on them. That's a good size blade, 12 inches. So you find one of those, you still have to have a dust collection system because the problem is they produce so much sawdust that if you're not sucking it out of the way, you create a fire hazard and um, it causes all sorts of other issues. So you got to, if you, the bigger the planer, the bigger the problem getting rid of the dust. And never forget, mesquite sawdust, if you develop the allergy, will drop you into anaphylactic shock and you will die in the sawdust with the dust in your lungs causing them to swell shut and your throat to swell shut and you will suffocate before you get to the hospital if you develop the allergy to mesquite sawdust. No joke. Okay, moving real down quick. Okay, clamp set. Everybody needs to get a clamp set. These are not real big deals, but they are kind of handy. Uh, wrench set, because you're going to be putting in wrenches. That means just a standard wrench set sockets and wrenches because you might be putting in bolts to bolt on the porch to the house and we unbolt it when we transport it uh, um, so you want a wrench set hammers sc speed square tape measure level hand chisel set chalk line stuff like that those are basic tools and i shouldn't necessarily say those would be more things that people want to have individually but you're going to have to have them in the shop too there's a bunch of paint stuff we haven't gone over that but this is just the basic tools i wanted to get to tonight a plan a plan b and again, great ideas uh, for the people that did show up here and helping out. But also, um, we're going to go over more of this later. But the goal of this is I'm going to have a nice cute little book for kids and adults that looks like it's for kids. Because a lot of kids are adults like me that decide to go back to being kids. And um, then that way we can teach it 
to the youngers because the elders may not be around forever to help the ones in the middle who don't want to learn anything. So we got to go ahead and try to figure out a way to teach the kids while they're really young so they can teach their parents later on all the stuff they learned when they were young that their parents neglected because they were all so busy shopping at Walmart and watching TV that they forgot to learn how to survive. So that said, I pushed myself to 10.09. I'm way past my limits. Thank you, Bob Tango. Yes, um, a, a pen. nobody can afford an EpiPen anymore. At two thousand dollars, no, 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 no. What you're going to go back and you're going to get your little bottle of Benadryl immediately. Have Benadryl on site all the time for all things. Have Benadryl, because the guy we had as manager originally started out he was just sneezing whenever we were milling mesquite, and then he started sneezing and getting some an allergy reaction, and then one day he went over there and he blew off the sawdust, poof, and it got on his lips. And his lips swelled up so much, by the time he got back to the office two blocks away, he looked like he was born black and he was actually Hispanic. And he had these big old lips, and had he breathed in instead, that would have happened to his throat. And he wouldn't have made it the two blocks. So the Benadryl got it down fast. So have Benadryl in your shop all the time. Because also, you develop the allergy over time. So you may not have the allergy for a long time. It's like poison oak or poison ivy. And all of a sudden, one day you got it. And so, if that one day arrives, you want Benadryl in your shop as one of your first aid kit components, please. I know. Who'd think? Also, in the future, Benadryl. Benadryl. And, and kids' Benadryl for the dogs. So, if they get bit in the face by a scorpion or something like that, give them kids' Benadryl. And that's great for dogs, too. That's your medical advice from I'm not a doctor. I'm a writer, a fictional writer, who happens to believe that health is a very wonderful thing, a positive thing. And Darby, who is actually a character of your imagination, a figment in this thing right now, is about to sign off. And the digital image that you are now seeing could have been made in the future. Could have been made in the past. But what is important for you is in the moment. What is your perspective? If you got anything out of this, it was worth it. Now, put together a package. Get some wood. Get an outpost put together. Get your friends in. I need a lot of people. I got $3 million worth of stuff. I'm going to need help to carry it out, load it up, and all this stuff. And that's what you guys will be involved in is helping put together hundreds of outposts that can network with each other. So you can go from one place to another and stay in your house here and then go over there and build a house over there and stay in the warm part of the country and then go over here and build another house. And when you're not there, you can either rent it out or let somebody who might need a place to live stay in it while you're gone and be the gardener for the little place. Because what do you want a gardener for? Because a gardener, a guard named Nur, if anybody goes around there, Nur's going to blow their dang head off. I love gardeners. Get them about 60 years old, 70 years old. Ain't nobody going to mess with your gardener. Your garden's going to be safe. Y'all take care now. Love you. Bye.